Northern New York Community Podcast, stories from the heart of our community. Hi there and welcome to the Northern New York Community Podcast. I'm your host, Max Del Signor. The North Country has been built on acts of generosity for centuries. Communities have been created and realized because of the leadership and philanthropy of many visionaries. Residents of Northern New York understand why this region is so special. Where you live becomes a part of your personal fabric. It is who you are. It may shape your everyday purpose in life, but in the North Country, your community gives you a sense of place. For Jeannie Brennan and Connie and Larry Barone, that sense of place is Sackett's Harbor, New York. The village neighboring Lake Ontario is steeped in rich history dating back to the early 1800s. Jeannie, Connie, and Larry have devoted their lives not only to the preservation of the village's history, but other cultural elements that have made their community progressive. They are one of many families who have made giving back to Sackett's Harbor and the North Country a lifelong priority. It is a pleasure to have Jeannie, Connie, and Larry join us on the podcast. Well, thanks for inviting us. Now, before we dive in, let's, let's set the record straight, first and foremost, on the spelling of Sackett's Harbor. It's been well documented, and it's been a debate for many years, um, whether it's one T, two T's, is there an apostrophe S potentially in the name for the municipality? Jeannie, can you share or provide us the official story behind the accurate spelling of Sackett's Harbor? My husband researched that for quite a while, and uh, on the tombstone for Augusta Sackett in the, in the Lakeside Cemetery, it's spelled with one T. And then we have a plate with all the uh, uh, autographs of the original founders of the village. And again, there it's still spelled with just one T. Why do you think there was so much confusion over the years of saying, well, there was an extra T in his name, even though the tombstone states otherwise? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the reason that for the two T's, I think, and the fact that they spelled harbor, O-U-R, instead of R, was because it probably sounded a little more elegant than just Sackett, S-A-C-K-E-T. So they, you know, different people would decide that that was the way it had to be spelled. But as I said, Bob researched it, and uh, there was an article in the paper, two T's are not two T, or something like that. And, uh, but it is supposed to be just one T. Now, Jeannie, you were a first grade teacher at Sackett's Harbor Central School for 30 years. Can you share with us what education was like in the North Country when you were a teacher? We didn't have all the technology that we have now. It was a blackboard and chalk. And uh, the children, I think, if you treated them with respect, they were very eager to learn and they wanted to do their best for you as a teacher and for their parents both. And so over the years, I could see that uh, as a whole group, they, when they first came to school, they didn't know each other. But by the end of the year, they really were uh, shared with each other all the things that they had done that year. And they were always willing to help any new student that came in during the year to show him how you did things and where you did things. And uh, I evidently re uh, earned a reputation of being fair, but uh, I expected them to behave because one little boy went home and said, told his mother, you can't get away with anything with Mrs. Brennan. I think she's got eyes in the back of her head. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And another little boy went home one day and went right upstairs to his room instead of going out to play. So his mother thought he was ill. She went up to find out what was wrong. She said he was very busily putting his, uh, straightening up his room and putting things where they should be. Mm -hmm. So she asked him, why are you doing that? Well, Mrs. Brennan said you should keep things neat. So I don't know <laughs> if it lasted his whole life, but at least for first grade it did. So, so the message kind of sank in with some of your students. It, it did indeed, right, yeah. When I retired, one of the second grade teachers informed me that she was very glad I had retired because she said, now I won't have to hear all year long everything Mrs. Brennan did, everything Mrs. Brennan said. <laughs> so, and I met a lady uh, a month or so ago and she informed me that she had been one of my students 55 years ago and she said, you're the only grade teacher that I remember out of all my years of being in school. So that made me feel kind of good. 
Yeah. Well, and the impact for you has certainly gone beyond education. In, in referencing your husband, Bob, the, the two of you really devoting your entire lives to local history is something that oh, has been right. indelible in the village of Sackets Harbor and really the town of Hounsfield. Right. Where did that passion, that interest in local history for the two of you, where did that come from? Well, Bob was very proud of the fact that he was born in Sackets and they lived on the same property until he was 92 years old and he liked uh, military history. And of course we had Madison Barracks, which is adjacent to the village. And he did a lot of, for years he researched the history of the village, Madison Barracks and what is now Fort Drum. And he would go through the microfilms at the Flower Library, microfilms of the Watertown Daily Times, and researching each one of those from 1818 up to 1973. Any article that he found that had to do anything with Sackett's, Madison Barracks, or Fort Drum, uh, he would make copies of that. And so we have, I think there's 33 ring binders. They probably weigh about five pounds a piece or more. And he would make copies of those articles and we made an index of each book. And then over the years, if people came to the village of the, of the, at the municipal building, they would send them over to our house and Bob would give them the information about maybe their ancestors that had been stationed at Madison Barracks, or if they wanted the history of the village, he was willing to share with him all that. And over the years, we purchased many postal cards about Sackets and photos and things. And so eventually in 2000, uh, Arcadia Publishing asked us if we would um, do a book on the village, which we did. And uh, one also on Fort Drum, and those have been purchased by, well, I think Sackett's book is up to almost 4,000 copies now that have been sold. And the royalties from those two books were shared with the uh, Village Pickering Beach Museum and the Hay Memorial Library in the village. So we were always able to uh, give back in that way to the village. Now, Connie, you grew up in Sackett's Harbor, graduated from Sackett's Harbor Central School. You've been a world traveler. You've been a director at a historical society in Elmira, New York. You share, it seems to be, the same passion as your parents for local history. Um, approximately 15 years ago, you and Larry moved back to the area after being away for some time. What was the reason for coming back to the community? And what are some of those feelings that you had about your hometown? Well, growing up in Sackett's Harbor was, of course, very special because of the history. And I think also the um, the serenity of the community, people knew each other, everyone in those days knew everybody else in the village. Uh, the harbor was undeveloped, it was open and very natural. So it was a very beautiful setting. And um, when I was in college, I worked at the village's Pickering Beach Museum a couple of summers and uh, found a real interest in the thought that I could work at a museum for my career, uh, which is what I did. And then after all of those years, to come back to Sackett's, certainly coming back to be near uh, my parents, and uh, a, a pleasant, peaceful place to retire. Uh, but then I got a full-time job, so I actually really didn't retire. And um, and working in a, in a business now where we can continue to effectively, I hope, promote the preservation of the, the community's history and uh, begin to um, continue to disseminate that information. And with technology today, that information can really go worldwide. Tell us a little bit about your current role um, and what you're doing as director of the, the battlefield site in the village, correct? Right, yes. Yeah. So um, um, New York State Parks has about 30 or so historic sites across the state. And Sackett's Harbor is um, one of the very few that really totally focuses on the War of 1812. Uh, I think one of the interesting aspects is that the National Park Service a number of years ago did a big study and designated Sackett's Harbor as one of the top War of 1812 sites in the country. So that's quite a, a distinction. And then during the War of 1812 Bicentennial, we did a number of programs in the community, particularly at the historic site, 
And uh, some of them were, as we say, maybe transitory, such as living history, reenacting, but things that are much more permanent, we did the um, establishing of several monuments. And so, it, you know, as you visit Sackett's Harbor and you come to the Memorial Tree Grove, which was established in 1913, on the 100th anniversary of the Second Battle of Sackett's Harbor, there is that beautiful granite monument that the Daughters of the War of 1812 funded and had installed. So now we have two additional granite monuments on the property. Uh, New York State purchased more land in recent years to extend the battlegrounds. And now on those battlegrounds, there is a, a granite monument to the American troops who fought during the War of 1812 and then also a monument to the Crown forces, the opposing forces, who uh, of course had casualties as well. And the British documented those casualties in great detail. So we knew the names of the 40 or so men who were left behind, who died at the battle, left behind, buried somewhere in the field. And then that granite monument recognizes their contributions Larry, Sackett's Harbor has become um, kind of like your adopted home in a lot of ways. You're from Batavia, New York, many years as an art educator. What is it about Sackett's Harbor and the North Country that really impresses you the most? Well, you know, my first contact with the village was through, uh, you know, my relationship with Connie. And uh, I think my first visit probably was either in the late 60s or early 1970. And, uh, you know, as, as soon as I walked through the door at the Brennan home, uh, I, I could see, you know, the, the, the love of Sackett's Harbor and the North Country environment uh, through the collection and, you know, the conversations we would have around the dinner table. So, uh, yeah, it didn't take long for me to become very comfortable with that. And then over the years, as Connie and I pursued our careers in other areas of either Massachusetts or uh, the southern tier of New York. Uh, you know, we would come to many of the summer programs, uh, you know, reenactments at the battlefield, uh, Fourth of July fireworks, uh, fi firemen's field days, and the Brennan home is right there in the heart of the village, so it was pretty easy just to walk out and and see, you know, the community and how the community would come together for these events year in and year out. And when Connie and I were ready to retire, or at least we began thinking about retirement, Sackis was certainly at the top of that list of places that we would, you know, like to, you know, retire to, uh, primarily, you know, to be, you know, closer to Bob and Jean. Uh, but as it worked out, we both were able to, you know, pursue our own careers. Uh, Connie going to work almost immediately as a site manager at the State Historic Site, and uh, and I over the over the first few years establishing a, a an art gallery in downtown Sac. It's that started small, and it's still pretty small, but it's grown. And my presence and our commitment to the core of the business district has grown with our purchase of building and, uh, and not only providing a gallery studio space for myself but we also have two rental units that you know have made it kind of interesting we are we've we've always rented to for the most part young military officers from Madison Bar or excuse me from Fort Drum through that I think made a bigger connection with you know the day-to-day -day life of our military in the North Country in a more casual, off-face environment. Sure. Now, your talent's very much in the arts, and beyond the gallery, you have had many works, uh, have shared them globally, um, not, and not just locally. What are some of the opportunities, the activities, things that you have seen within the village in terms of the growth of the arts in Sackett's Harbor in the, in the last 15 years that you've been here? Well, you know, when, when, we, first, when we first arrived, uh, I got interested in the Sackett's Harbor Historical Society. They really played an important role in uh, the development of several important historic buildings in downtown Sackett's, one of them being the, the bank building. And there was a wing 
that the Historic Society was basically using as our home base. Uh, but we, we uh, partnered with the Artists Association of Northern New York, which was a spin-off of a bigger organization that was central, centered more around the Watertown area. And they, that group came to Sackett's, uh, occupied the wing of the bank building as their temporary ga gallery as that particular group and the society looked for funding to uh, open up the historic Hooker House, uh, which is where the Annie organization is currently uh, situated. Uh, that, that building is owned by the historic society and, and we were pivotal, pivotal in the, the development and funding of the exterior renovation structural renovation of the building and the arts group uh, took on the responsibility of, of opening the gallery portion, the interior. So it's been that kind of partnership that's been going on for about 10 years. That kind of sums up the, uh, you know, the, uh, the visual art component that we see here in the village. But you know, there's also community uh, choirs and, and musical groups and through the church and sometimes just through local interests that have uh, come to flourish in Sackets. And uh, that, that's all part of the big picture in terms of the arts in the village. Your family and many others in Sackets Harbor have shown a willingness to make the community where you live more vibrant. Why is being philanthropic, whether it's time, talent, financial capabilities or otherwise, why is that so vital in making a community thrive here in the North Country? Well, I think you have to have not only uh, the funds, but you also have to have the people uh, to make things happen. So there's two important components, and then you have to have the environment as well. And Sackett seems to have those components. We've been doing it actually since before the War of 1812, I suppose. So for a couple hundred years, People have been uh, pulling together to make things happen. I think the interesting part is about Sackett's as well is not only its strategic importance in the past for military aspects, but it's strategically important today for tourism. And that is very important. Uh, having Madison Barracks in the village, I know, really shaped a lot of the culture and the sense of place, but also the interaction between the military and the civilians and uh, cultural diversity uh, because the military brought diversity with it and uh, in some cases historically it, it didn't work and in other cases it did work and I think the long-term benefits are people from Madison Barracks who chose to live in Sackets, make it their home, uh, raise their families and continue on. I could think of several families that contributed greatly over the years who came through the military through Madison Barracks. And today, we still have that tremendous connection, but it's with Fort Drum. And so we have many military-associated families and individual people who live in the village, but work at Fort Drum. So we continue to have that military-civilian connection. Mm -hmm. Diversity is a great point in thinking about how communities evolve over time and, and how that diversity is really integrated within those uh, residents that maybe have been there for generations. In thinking about the evolution of the village from a historical cultural perspective, what are some of the important examples of philanthropy that you've seen, uh, other projects, programs that have taken place that have maybe embraced that diversity um, but have also allowed the community to really take off because of that? What about uh, Marietta Pickering Hay and all that she did for the village? Oh, the, yeah. the, right. Well, the uh, Pickering family came to the village in, just before the War of 1812, and they built a home in 1817 where it is now opposite the battlefield site. And uh, Marietta was very, uh, well, community-minded. and. Uh, she had the uh, nine bells erected in the tower of the Presbyterian Church in honor of her family. And uh, on each of the bells, it's the name of the husband and the wife. And then in 1899, when they had a huge fire and those bells fell 
to the ground, of course. She had them sent, the remains sent down to Troy, New York, and had them recast so that they are still in the village now and are played periodically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then she, the, down through the family, eventually the Ewers, who were part of the family, when they passed away in Bermuda, they left the village, they left the house and its furnishings to the village to be used as a museum, and which it has done over the many years. And for about, well, for 27 years, I was in charge of that. So we managed between uh, volunteers to have the museum open each year for visitors to go through and usually would have bus tours come through and local you know, people from other villages around. So it just continued the um, showing people how the house was furnished and how the family lived until uh, the finally the, the, the last pickerings of people of the family were gone in 1936. And then also she established the library. Oh yes, right, you know, in the a tower of the Presbyterian Church they had the White Library, I believe they call it the White Library, and uh, she and her husband had a huge collection of all sorts of volumes of books and things, and those, uh, that's where the, before the library was built on the front of the Presbyterian Church, that was the, what they called the White Library, and people would go there to uh, borrow books and, and uh, you know, use the references that they had. And Pickering Beach, of course, has survived on volunteers, as many of the organizations in Sackets. Right. Well, it was first it was uh, taken over by a group of ladies called the Civic Improvement League, and they took care of it for many years. Eventually, uh, their members were older. They either moved away or passed away, and so the museum sat empty for about 10 years, and it was in quite a bad state of disrepair and I was asked if I would like to uh, take care of it. So I had retired then in 87. I said, oh, sure. And so that's how I got involved with that, working with that for, and finally, a couple of years ago, I had to retire from doing that work. But it's always been staffed by volunteers and been very successful, has many interesting articles in it for people to see and the uh, bus tours would walk, come through and they doesn't look like a large building from the outside but it's quite there's quite a few rooms and lots of things to look at to tell about augustus pickering and his career and how he committed suicide and um, how the rest of the family survived how important are those volunteer groups to the success of a smaller community um, if it's not for efforts like that, you may not have some of these museums or other smaller nonprofits that can survive in a small community. How important are those groups? Very, very important. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to have it open. You know, I believe now they do. Of course, we all did that. We weren't paid for anything. And I never was paid to, for anything. But I believe now they are hiring someone to uh, have it open. But I'm not sure about that. But it's important that you. And we were always lucky to always have a good group of people who were, and I re, after I researched the family and the, everything else, I wrote up a, uh, uh, well, a brochure, I guess, it's called FYI for your information. And I said, you know, if you're going to take people through the museum, you should know something about the family and something about the furnishings that were in there. And so that kind of helped people out because they, didn't just walk through and say, well, this is this and this is that. Yep. So I think also at the uh, battlefield site, volunteers are extremely important. And um, one of the things that has been very key to the educational programming is developing a core of volunteers. And today we have almost 50 volunteers that we can draw upon. Uh, they're not only Sackett's Harbor residents, but Watertown, Black River, uh, people are willing to come because they enjoy it so much. Either we're dealing with school students or we have groups of adults who come to the community and we wouldn't be able to do all of the school tour programs which are very activity based uh, without a core of volunteers who lead those activities for the students. 
County, you see a lot of these school groups, as you mentioned, come through the site. In thinking about the next generation and their involvement, either whether it's to volunteer or being engaged in the community, how can we inspire youth uh, to give back just as your generation and your mother's generation have before? Well, I think you have to have a, a, some kind of a connection. You need to experience uh, in a positive way, for example, visiting Sackets Harbor if, if you're a fourth grader or second grader, and those positive experiences to know that something important happened there. I think that's um, how you can take those dreams that the students have and maybe their career choices and they, they may diverge and go somewhere else for a long time, but maybe they come back as well because they, they have that remembrance, that sense of place, and they then begin to carry that on for new generations. I remember as a child, I don't know how old I was, but I remember being at the battlegrounds, walking on the stone wall, uh, you know, very young, maybe, I don't know, seven, eight years old, and then also the Centennial Monument, that walking around the base of that in your bare feet as a child, and you felt that cold, the granite, and how nice that felt in the summertime on a hot summer day. And when we sit there now in the summer and we watch on Sunday afternoon the concerts in progress, and inevitably there are little kids who want to walk around the base of that monument. So that's been going on uh, probably for a hundred years or more now uh, because the monument was set up in 1913. So, you know, parents, um, adults bring the kids, they let them touch the monument, walk on the base, and so there are those connections that are being made. How important is philanthropy as a whole to the North Country's future? Well, I think of people you know, we want to we want to continue the uh, atmosphere in the North Country. It's the greatest place to live, I would say. You know, it's quiet. We you're able to do whatever you want to do, and by everybody uh, giving forth. Well, like Bob and I, we felt we were very fortunate that we were able to uh, donate money to the foundation, so it has a broader base instead of just keeping it in the village and we have, you can do more with a broader base and you can touch more communities that way. And it's, it's just, just part of being a member of, the, of this area. Yeah, I think everybody has to work together to maintain an area, a region. We see ways in Sackets Harbor where people have uh, joined forces to make positive things happen within the village and within the town that surrounds the village. And then as you keep uh, spreading out from there and you're looking at uh, the bigger picture, the whole North Country, then it takes a lot of people working together to make positive things happen. We're truly fortunate and grateful to have you share your community story with us and being able to articulate what it means to be a part of the North Country. And thank you so much, Jeannie, Connie, Larry, for being with us and sharing your, your story on our podcast. Our pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening to this great community story and about these important acts of philanthropy taking place in the North Country. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll hope you'll join us again. Northern New York Community Podcasts, stories from the heart of our community.